Okay, got it. I'm going to mute myself and shut off my video, um, and then we can start the webinar. Sounds good. Looks like we're slowly coming into the webinar, but I'd like to take a moment just to welcome everyone who's participating today. And thank you for just spending this time um, digging deep into the simulation. Today's interactive session is an En-ROADS climate workshop um, simulating global solutions. And we're happy to have this facilitated workshop as a part of our larger seminar series towards climate and community, a faithful action for climate justice. For accessibility purposes, I'm gonna give a physical description of myself. I'm Mexican American with dark brown hair and brown eyes. I'm sitting in my office. So there's a bookshelf in the background and plants. My name is Reverend Katie Monforte, and I'm the Education Program Coordinator with the General Board of Church and Society. And along with me is our staff member, uh, my colleague, Amy Hong. Just a note that we will have a few minutes at the close of today's workshop to do announcements. And I'm so glad to be able to welcome Yasmin Zahar who serves as the project manager for Climate Interactive's Climate and Energy team, where she supports the development and diffusion of the organization's climate change simulators to help people see connections, play out scenarios, and see what works to address climate change, inequity, and related issues like energy, health, and food. She completed a dual master's program um, in global environmental politics and natural resources and sustainable development at American University in DC. And uh, this program was dual with the University of Peace in um, Ciudad Colon, uh, Costa Rica. She is currently based uh, in DC, but previously worked with several policy, um, climate policy uh, advocacy nonprofits. Yasmin has engaged in both domestic and international climate policy efforts and enjoys exploring these issues through the lens of justice. So thank you so much for being with us here today and for your leadership and facilitation. Thanks. Thank you so much, Katie. So happy to be here. Hi, everybody. So my name is Yasmin Zahar. And just a quick physical description. I am Lebanese American and I have dark brown hair and I am sitting in a room with a bit of a blurred background to kind of hide some of the messiness back there. Um, and I am really excited to be here and share uh, some of our tools with you so that we can all get acquainted with some global climate solutions and work together to uh, build a climate future and scenario that we can all be proud of and excited about. And so that's what we'll be doing for the duration of this workshop. I'll just share my screen quickly. And so this is the interface that we'll be looking at for most of today. And so this is our En-ROADS model. And so this is a model that was developed by our team here at Climate Interactive alongside our partners at the MIT Sloan School of Management. And it's gone through many phases over almost 20 years of being worked on. And we update it every month to reflect the latest available science. And it's a model that's rooted in system dynamics. So it's a really interesting 
tool that allows us to see the relationship between different climate solutions, different actions that we take, because a lot of times when we're thinking about an action or a policy or a behavioral shift, we think about it in kind of a silo and what will happen when we just do that one thing without often taking into account how it might impact other solutions, other actions, other systems. And so this gives us kind of a holistic look at how different behaviors and solutions and actions interact with each other, what actions might be more powerful and impactful than we might have thought, which ones might actually be less impactful at a global scale. And so what we'll be doing today with uh, a lot of your help and input is building a scenario with several different climate actions to limit warming to this international agreed upon goal of well below two degrees, aiming for 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming. And so it's going to allow you all to kind of challenge and reflect on what we call our mental models. So kind of the initial reactions that we might have uh, given our preconceived notions of things or how we view things as how they might be. And so we're going to challenge that a little bit, see what you all are thinking and work together to create this scenario. And so just to kind of orient ourselves a little bit on this model here and to give a kind of brief introduction to what we're looking at, this is what we call our baseline scenario. So this is a scenario that we've created given no significant climate action. And what we kind of see is just this reasonable starting point that we can build on with climate action. And so on the left, you'll see our sources of energy around the world out through 2100. So we'll see our fossil fuels increasing a little bit, renewable energy increasing quite a bit over time, our bioenergy and nuclear energy staying pretty consistent uh, throughout the end of the century, and something we call our new zero carbon source of energy. So this is a source of energy that currently might not yet have come to market and be deployed at a big enough scale, but if we were to invest in it heavily, it might. Uh, and it's a energy supply that doesn't emit any carbon. And so that's kind of what our energy mix or our fuel mix uh, might look like now out through 2100, given no significant climate action. And we update this baseline scenario based on the latest market trends, uh, latest implemented policies and actions, and then on the right, we have our greenhouse gas net emissions by gas. And so this is where our emissions are coming from. Where, are, where is the warming coming from? What gases and industries and sources are we seeing those emissions come from? So globally, we've got our land use CO2. So that's our most primarily our forestry and our planting of trees and our cutting down of trees. We have what you don't see in this graph yet is this legend point here called other CDR, which is other forms of carbon dioxide removal. So what we might expect uh, negative emissions to look like. So different technologies that are pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, for example, when we talk about things like net zero, oftentimes we are imagining forms of carbon removal as well. Uh, we have our energy CO2, which is this kind of darkest gray wedge here. And so this is our largest source of greenhouse gas emissions. And so that's just our entire energy system that is uh, currently with no significant change or action, very reliant on carbon emitting sources, namely our fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas. And then we have our additional greenhouse gases. So 
most oftentimes we'll think about carbon dioxide as our main greenhouse gas, but we've got others that also contribute to warming. So we have our F gases in that gold line here, which comes from uh, things like our refrigerants and other appliances. We have CH4, our methane, mostly comes from our agricultural practices. And we have N2O, so our nitrous oxide also comes from a lot of our industrial practices. And so given this fuel mix and these expected trends out through 2100, uh, we might expect to see temperature change rise to around 3.6 degrees Celsius by 2100. And so that's just a starting point for us to kind of look into and see how we can get that number down to two degrees and aiming for a 1.5 degree world. And so what we're going to be doing, I'll, I'll just show you quickly how the model itself works, is we're gonna take these 18 different solutions here and given what you all choose to test and uh, think might have the biggest impact, we'll work on building a scenario together. So let's say we're looking at coal and I move this slider here. You'll notice that not only does coal this coal line change, but a lot of things change. So that's the beauty of the system model, right? So we have the fuel mix changing. We have this graph changing. We see our temperature change a bit. And so what we're going to do is build a scenario and get this number down, talk about the different dynamics that are happening that we're seeing and challenge some of the maybe notions that we had share with each other uh, what those notions were so that we can support each other in you say oh you know I also agreed with that or uh, challenge each other or support each other um, and kind of work together on that to see what kind of future we can build together and so the way we're going to do that, and the way that I would love to get your input into it is through this software called Poll Everywhere. And I'll just share it quickly in the chat here. So if you all could go to this link and just take a moment to click on one of these solutions and deciding which one you would like us to test. So this could be a solution that you think will have the greatest impact if implemented at a global scale, one that is important to you, means a lot to you, uh, one that you've been trying to implement in your own life, different solutions that you might think have a really big impact. So I see we're starting to get some pins in there. Thanks everybody. So we'll just give folks a few more seconds to continue voting. And then once we've got uh, a good number here, I will perhaps pick the top three to get us started. And then we can start building on that scenario. So thanks everybody for your votes so far. We'll just give maybe another minute or so. We've got a good spread right now. Nice. All right, thanks folks. I'll just start making some notes as people continue to vote. And if you're having trouble with the pins, I see a couple people in the chat, you can feel free to write your answer in the chat and I'll take that into account.
All right, thanks all. All right, so I see we've got some great answers coming into the chat as well. All right. So I think maybe for our top four, we've got a lot of great answers coming into the chat as well. We'll do coal. I see a few more for renewables. We've got a good amount of votes for deforestation. And few coming into the chat on carbon price. So let's start with those four. And I see people wanting to vote for several ones and that's totally fine. We'll, we'll be doing that as well. So if you start with one, we'll have the options to vote for a few more. So uh, feel free to kind of pick your top one and then we will have the option to work through that a little bit more. All right, so thanks everybody for your votes. Let me just check the chat quickly. All right, it seems like we covered most of these. And I see Robert asking, so how the simulation works and uh, how the model works. So this is a model that is built in a software called Bensim. So in the back end, there's tens of thousands of equations running. And we've been able to kind of turn that wonky back end side into a pretty well presented front end interface. So if I move a slider, there's those tens of thousands of equations running in the back that restructure the model so that you see this. And so that's how things change really fast. And that's how we can build on different solutions together. So the way that it'll work is we'll test out different solutions, build one on top of another so that we can take a look at what a more kind of in-depth scenario of climate solutions might look like. And if you have more detailed questions about how the model works and some of the assumptions that we make, I'll be happy to answer those towards the end. And so let's take a look at uh, coal which I have as our first one here. So when we think about coal use around the world, we see that globally, we see that there's uh, still potential for it to be increasing around the world. And so while we might not think about it in certain places where it's decreasing or it's been banned or it's been stopped, globally, we might expect to see this kind of slight increased trend throughout the end of the century. And so if we wanna reduce that, the way that we do that here is, we might call it a tax, but maybe I'll put it at highly taxed, but that's essentially something that any action that is increasing the price of coal. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a government tax. It could also be something like divestments uh, away from coal. So something that is making it harder to produce coal. And so you see when we go from there, we're kind of getting this, let's put us here. We're getting a decrease in coal. And what's happening is when we go from here to here, we're seeing a change in our energy mix. So because we're using less coal, we are also seeing an increase in renewable energy. We're seeing an increase in natural gas, which we don't often think about. So in order to make up for the loss of production of energy of coal, we tend to have to fill in some of those gaps. And so given the current prices of energy, we might expect renewables and natural gas to, to take that. 
And when we're looking, I see a question in the chat on the scale. Sure. So when when we're talking about this, we're talking at a global scale. And so when we're looking at an example, which can sometimes be hard to kind of quantify, but if you're looking for specific numbers, a very high tax would be uh, something along the lines of $74 per ton of coal equivalent. And so we can look, some of those mean a bit less to people than others. Some of these might be a bit easier to kind of quantify, but this would be a tax or anything that is increasing the price of coal. And so when we're thinking about this, one of the most important considerations that we don't often think about when we're implementing policies is we like to kind of look at it in two different ways. Um, we have this concept called uh, multi-solving, which uh, Beth Sowen, who's one of our co-directors, uh, founded this idea, which is this concept of how can we solve multiple problems with one solution. And so when we are th implementing something like a coal tax or we're reducing the amount of coal, I'd love to hear from you all in that using that same poll everywhere software. What are, there's kind of two prongs that we like to consider every time we are implementing a policy. So one is, what are some equity considerations that might actually be of concern when we're implementing a policy? So what are some potentially negative outcomes that we might see or that we should be aware of when we are crafting a policy or an action when it comes to crafting a policy? Yes, job loss, definitely. Um, and then on the other side of that, what are some co-benefits that you might hope to capture in a policy. So what positives might you see out of a policy and what, what might you try to hope increases? Yes, increased costs for poor to heat homes, definitely. So that increased cost of energy is a huge factor when we're talking about changing energy supplies. Yep. And so when we're thinking about those policies, having kind of a reflection towards the needs of the poorest and the most vulnerable people. Yes, cleaner air, definitely. So that's a huge co-benefit, especially when it comes to coal reduction. We can take a bit more of a look on that. New economic sectors created, definitely. Citizen involvement, yes. Yes, job loss, quality of life. Benefits might include better health and more opportunities. Yes. And so this is really important when we're looking at global policies is who is actually losing access to power and who is, uh, what access are we limiting or allowing? And when we're talking about positives, lowers environmental racism and air pollution near coal plants, yes. And so how can we shift that? Mm -hmm. So definitely improved human health, shared decision-making, super important. Mm, coal mining companies might abandon their mines leading to possible less monitoring of toxic wastes. Yes, these are amazing answers. Thank you, everybody. And so I'll move us back for now. And I see we have some few in the chat. Mm-hmm. Yep, poor folks unable to afford energy for cooling or heat, reducing impacts of mining and extraction. Yeah, thanks everybody. It sounds like you all are really hitting the nail on the head with these. Um, so those are just some examples of when we're implementing policies, what we, what, what we might want to consider. And so I saw a lot of answers around air pollution and health. And so this is one of my favorite graphs to show when we're talking about, and we'll see how this continues to change as we add more policies. And so this is a really just kind of visual way to look at 
how air pollution would improve. So what we're looking at here, this black line is where we started and the blue line is where we'll be once we implement uh, this increased price on coal. And so when you think about a future that you're trying to build, one with cleaner air is such an important one. And so it's just a really impactful way to share what benefits could look like, um, especially when we're talking about climate solutions and climate policies. A lot of times people aren't able to quantify that in the real short near term. And so things like air pollution and closing down coal plants, which would benefit people's health really quickly, is just a really impactful way to talk about uh, solutions and just remind people that near-term benefits also exist when we're talking about climate policy and it doesn't need to be these kind of 20, 30 year benefits and that it's just having such a positive outcome in the near-term as well. So thanks everybody. Let me just check the chat. Hmm. Better health also contributes to higher productivity, definitely. And I think that's important when we're talking about, people forget a lot of kind of the rippling effects of benefits. Um, so that's a great point. All right, and so the next one that we can test out is renewable. So we saw that when we taxed coal or increased the price of coal, we saw renewables bump up a little bit. And so that's without going specifically directly after renewables and implementing even more of a subsidy. So if we were to subsidize renewables, either through a government subsidy or increased private investments that would make renewables cheaper. So we're at 3.4 degrees now. So I might ask you all, we're at 3.4 degrees. What do you think subsidizing renewables might get us to? What temperature change? So we're at 3.4 degrees. Given the fact that we've already increased the price of coal, we saw renewables bump up a little bit. But if we were to subsidize it even more, what might we see? So we might see 3.4 going few votes between three, 3.3, 3. some people 2.5 to 2.9, uh, a couple two to 2.4. Yeah, thanks everyone. So this is always a great exercise because uh, it's a way to kind of take a look at the impact we think that a policy might have. So thanks for those quick votes. It sounds like most people are in the camp of between three to 3.3 degrees. Someone thinking it might stay right around 3.4. Perfect. A, a few more people thinking it might get us all the way down to two, 2.4. Thanks everybody. And so let's test it out. So looking at these graphs again, Let's increase renewable energy. Let's bring it all the way. So we see that if we do that a couple more times. We see that green line spike up really dramatically. We see that it becomes the biggest source of energy, even surpassing uh, oil at around 2065. We'll take a look at it a few more times. So we notice the temperature going down to 3.3 degrees. This is often can be a surprise to people. Um, a lot of people imagine that it'll make a, a bigger impact than that. And there's a few different reasons why uh, it's a bit of a smaller impact than we might expect. We notice here too this energy CO2 wedge coming down a little bit. So a few different reasons why we see it having potentially less of an impact than we might expect is one in our baseline scenario, we're already seeing it increase. So it's been taken into account that it'll be increasing. And so we're, when we increase it even more, we 
ideally hope that it comes to market faster, but a big dynamic or insight at play here is uh, something called capital stock turnover. So this is the amount of time that it takes to change the source of something in terms of what is already exists, all of the fossil fuel plants that are already in existence and that might not be retired for a really long time leads to a delay in the system when it comes to bringing in renewable energy and making it cheaper speedens up that process. So you'll see here, it's going at a pretty slow rate and then it starts to jump up, but it's still taking almost 20 years to really start to ramp up. And so during that time, we're still burning a lot of coal, oil, and gas. So we don't see that immediate kind of drop in temperature because there are long delays in the system given the existing infrastructure, given the time it takes to build infrastructure and switch it out. And so those are, if not even just kind of a big visual look at the urgency of implementing action because of the often delayed time it takes for things to start having an impact and making it to market. And so if these policies were implemented today, it would still take time within this global system to really take off in a way that would really push fossil fuel energy down. And so when we see that, go that, do it a couple more times, we see another dynamic that exists here is what is renewable energy replacing, right? So we see that it's taking over coal and natural gas pretty well throughout the end of the century, not entirely, but it's bumping it down. And you'll notice that the red line of oil doesn't take uh, as much of a hit. And that's because we are still relying in this scenario that we've currently built, we might change it as we go. But in this current scenario, we're still relying quite a bit on oil to power our transport system, most notably. And so renewable energy won't necessarily replace oil if we are still relying on oil to power our transport system. So oil can often be the hardest energy supply to replace if we don't also couple our climate scenarios and solutions with a shift towards electricity-based systems because uh, you would need to have electrification and electricity-based systems to be able to replace a lot of energy supplies with renewable energy. So a lot of our electricity system might now be replaced with renewable energy, but we're still seeing oil not taking as much of that hit. And so we see that right now in the current scenario that we've built, we have renewable energy really taking off and through the end of the century takes over uh, all of our fossil fuels. Uh, but we do still see them uh, continuing to burn throughout the century, which is why we might not see as much of a difference in temperature as we might have expected. Uh, but we're going to, of course, see that and expect that to change as we continue building on the scenario. So Krista, I see you're asking about new zero carbon. So new zero carbon, you don't see that really showing up on this graph yet because it's a kind of potential for an energy supply that doesn't emit any carbon emissions, that doesn't fall under the scope of nuclear energy or renewable energy. Uh, some examples are nuclear fusion, thorium fission, which are concepts that haven't yet fully come to market yet, so they don't make a big enough impact on this graph. But if we chose to invest in them heavily enough that they would come to market in a big way, then you'll start to see that uh, line on the graph. 
So you'd have to intentionally invest in that. And so that would be what moving that slider is. Yeah, so Tina is asking, what if we stopped all new permits for fossil fuel infrastructure? That's a great one. I'll get to that after we test a couple of these other ones. So we actually have uh, some options to stop infrastructure as opposed to just taxing uh, the fuel. So we will test those. No problem, Krista. Um, all right. So next, I saw quite a few votes for deforestation. So when we think about deforestation, uh, that's often one of the top solutions that comes to mind is reducing uh, the cutting down of trees around the world. And so uh, we're at 3.3. Uh, I'll ask you actually, instead of what you think that the numbers might get us to, I'll ask you that same question here of when we're talking about deforestation, what are, when we're reducing deforestation, so around the world, we're either implementing policies that prevent deforesting, or we shift some of our agro, agricultural practices that require less deforestation. What are different considerations when it comes to deforestation efforts? This is especially important when we're thinking about global actions. So on the one side, what are some potential concerns when it comes to reducing deforestation? And what are some potential co-benefits uh, that you would want to uh, take into account? Yeah, these are already perfect. So a big concern is subsistence farmers trying to live uh, on degraded soils, the right of native peoples around the world. Yes. Yep, food prices rising, less displacement of indigenous peoples forestry employment, fuel for indigenous communities, habitat, habitat preservation. Yes, all really, really good answers. Mm -hmm. Carbon sinks are strengthening, yep. Animal extinction, definitely. And so taking into account some of these really, uh, really large, kind of considerations on, on both sides. And wood, weather, mm -hmm. frequently used for building homes, limiting of housing, yeah. And so another thing to kind of take into consideration, because especially when it comes to deforestation, we think about it as we might not always take into consideration a lot of these aspects. Mm hmm Air quality, I see in the chat. Yeah, thanks, Pat. Species loss. Mm hmm Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, these are great answers. And so when we take a look at deforestation, if you take a look at this graph here, greenhouse gas net emissions by gas. And so deforestation is gonna be our land use CO2. So when we take a look at this kind of big scale uh, greenhouse gas emissions across all sectors, we see that globally, it's usually less of a prominent line that we might expect. So let's say we eradicate deforestation around the world. Let's see it a couple more times. We're at 3.2 degrees. So deforestation is also oftentimes a solution that has less of an impact at a global scale than people think, but it doesn't take away from all of those 
really important co-benefits and considerations that we saw. And so it's still an impactful policy if it's done in the right way, but given, and it might have much higher of an impact, uh, especially uh, socially and through a justice lens in particular communities and locales, then it might at this global scale. So when we're looking at this global model, something again to take into account is how particular communities and smaller subsets of the world might have different impacts than we're seeing here. So globally, we might not see deforestation policies have as much of an impact as we might expect, but in certain communities, it's hugely important and it's a huge consideration. And so same goes for these energy sources. In certain countries and communities, the energy mix might be different. So you won't see the exact same numbers and graphs moving in the same way, but the dynamics that exist between different supplies and systems will be pretty similar. Mm -hmm. Christy saying that in the mountains, deforestation frequently leads to landslides and floods. Yes, and so just a lot of uh, community-centered examples and cases that make reducing deforestation have much more of a positive impact on so many parts of life. And so always important to take those into account. But so we're seeing here that we've taken it away and uh, we've done a great job doing that. And so we're at 3.2 degrees. And so the fourth one, before I ask you all the question again, and I see some uh, good suggestions in the chat and I'll give you all that same option to uh, click on a solution again. Um, and I saw a lot of advocacy for a carbon price. So when we're talking about a carbon price, again, there are so many different ways to implement a carbon price. There are different ways to implement it at a local scale, at a national scale. This would be at a global scale, so kind of a global average around the world. And so this is another really important one to ask this question. So I'll ask it to you all. So when we're talking about a carbon price, so that is talking about increasing the cost of coal, oil, and natural gas and making it harder uh, for it to produce and taxing the producers of those fuels to in order to lower the amount of our fossil fuel use. And so there's so many different ways to do that. Um, and I'll talk about a few of them as some of these answers come in. So when we implement a carbon price, what are some different considerations for us to take into account? Uh, a lot of them will be similar to what we saw earlier, uh, but I'd love to hear from you all again. Mm -hmm. So where is the cost being held? So will the cost be then shifted to those who are already struggling? So if a company is going to be taxed, what is preventing them from the sh them just shifting that cost to their consumers who are already struggling with energy costs? So it needs to be paired with rebating or crediting the proceeds to lower income peoples or countries or environmental programs. Yes, so that's a huge thing when we're talking about carbon pricing is what do we do with the revenue of a carbon price? Do we give it out equally? Do we create systems where it's given to those most in need or those most vulnerable? Enforcement might be difficult worldwide, definitely. That's a huge, even locally, it's, it's, we've seen it be a challenge around the world to implement carbon pricing. Increased revenue could be used to develop more just systems, yes. So what we do with the revenue is hugely important when we're talking about carbon pricing. Mm -hmm. So a carbon fee plus that dividend of giving it back out to folks. 
Yep. So that it's only affecting people who are really out of that majority of people who might actually see the benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do we couple a carbon price, which might increase the cost of energy with subsidizing renewables so that perhaps it's, you have more access to energy in a way that isn't really hiking up your bill too much. Mm -hmm. Thanks everybody. Really great answers as always. All right. So when we're talking about a carbon price, Again, your answers were spot on when it comes to some considerations. So let's take maybe, let's put it over here. We see a pretty big jump. So when we're talking about a high carbon price, um, what we mean specifically um, with what I just chose was about $73 per ton, which is pretty high. Uh, when we look globally. So that's something to take into consideration. Uh, another thing is given a lot of policies and systems that have been talked about when we're developing carbon prices are, do we want to kind of phase it in a bit slower and not start right at 73? Maybe we're starting slower and each year we increase it, which might address some of those problems that we saw uh, in that poll question of how do we reduce that burden on, on people's energy bills? Um, and so let's replay that a couple of times. So here we're seeing quite a big bump and a, well, quite a bit of change in both of our graphs here. So we went from 3.2 degrees to 2.8 degrees. And so that's a pretty significant change and maybe one of the biggest that we've seen uh, from all of the different actions that we've tested so far. So a few big dynamics to note here is we see that all of our fossil fuels are decreasing because once you implement a carbon price high enough, even uh, an energy supply like oil, which is pretty hard to displace in a a system that is heavily dependent on oil for its transport, um, you are starting to see that take a bit of a hit, not as much as coal or gas, but it's starting to bump down. And then we're seeing renewable energy alongside increase. And so for the person in the poll who wrote um, that at the same time, we should be subsidizing renewables, definitely. And that's why it's also an important consideration when we're talking about policies is to build them together in this holistic way, because the way that the systems work, naturally, renewable energy will become cheaper and increase without having to add an additional subsidy because we've increased the price of carbon of carbon intensive sources. And so thinking about what level of subsidy makes sense given the fact that the price will already change based on implementing the carbon price. So if we look at it just in silos, we're going to be looking at renewables by itself and saying whatever other policies are happening, we want the subsidy to be this amount. But if we know that other policies are going to be implemented, what is the correct number or amount that we want to subsidize it that will really complement it in the best way. So when we look at that a couple of times, we start seeing renewables continuing to spike. If we look at our transport system, even without particular policies around transport electrification yet, because we've displaced oil, we'll naturally see a shift to a bit of an increased share of our transport system becoming electrified. And so that's another way when we might test transport electrification coming up. What has already happened in the system and in the market that causes it to increase naturally and how can we complement that even more? 
So we see that we see it and even in the baseline increasing, but we see that shifting away from oil allows it to increase even more just kind of on its own. And so how can we complement that even more? And so we are at uh, 2.8 degrees. We see that this wedge is starting to bump down. And so let me ask us that same question. So let's just look at the scenario again. So in our scenario, we have uh, we've taxed coal, we have subsidized renewable energy, we've implemented a carbon price, and we've uh, reduced deforestation. And so given this scenario, what are some other solutions and policies that you'd like to take a look at coupled with this scenario uh, to get us further and further down in our warming? So let me ask this question again. All right, so I have already noted um, for the person in the chat who asked about stopping uh, fossil fuel infrastructure. So that's on my list. And let's see what else people would like to take a look at. And again, if you're having trouble in the poll, uh, you can feel free to write it in the chat and I'll take that into account. All right, thanks to those in the chat. See, we've got in the chat a couple more votes for energy efficiency, population growth, electric vehicles, new zero carbon, oil reduction. Thanks everyone. All right, so bioenergy. Let's do, I'll do another four. So let's do, I see a few voids for oil. So what I'll do is for oil, that's where we can test what stopping infrastructure might look like. And then I see we've got a few votes for methane and other greenhouse gases. We have electrification of transport. Yeah, thanks everybody. There's some really great options in the chat. Some are harder to model than others, especially when it comes to budget reduction, especially of the military. Um, it's not something that we can necessarily model here, but something when we're talking about something like that is what effects would reducing <clears throat> something like a military budget have within these solutions, but uh, not, necessarily something we will be able to look at today. And when we're talking about Dane, I see supporting women and their reproductive needs, definitely. That's something that we see both having an impact on almost across all of these sectors, but we talk about it when it comes to um, population growth and what that might look like differently if we were supporting women more around the world. Mm -hmm. Fracking and natural gas, yep. I saw quite a bit in the chat for energy efficiency. So I'll put that here. So we'll start with these and uh, we can continue talking about a lot of these different solutions because I see that there's this interest for almost all of them, which is amazing. 
All right. So we are going to start with stopping infrastructure of uh, our oil here. So again, when we're talking about different policies and actions, we are talking about different ways to do that. So one of those ways is making it more expensive. So that's kind of what this main slider does. Um, but there's other ways which would look like, which someone suggested in the chat, what if we just prevented new infrastructure from being built entirely, which would force that red line here to come down because we are just preventing new infrastructure from being built. Because when we talked about the different dynamics that exist between a lot of different solutions, infrastructure is a huge reason for delays in the system, for oil being continuing to being burned, a lot of our fossil fuels continuing to being burned out through the century. So what would happen if we stopped building new oil infrastructure? So let's take a look. So I'm going to click this. And so keep your eyes on that red line, which is also this same line here on this right graph. So this is where we started. This is where we've come given our carbon price. And so look at what happens when we stop infrastructure. So there's actually quite a few dynamics happening here. And those dynamics will be different, of course, based on what the existing policies are. So if we replay that, we see a huge change in the energy mix, but we actually don't see as big of a change as we'd expect in temperature. And so when we look at that, you'll notice it come down a bit on the Fahrenheit side, uh, just not big enough to come down on the Celsius side. But we see that huge replacement of renewable energy uh, for oil. So a couple more times. So because of all of the different policies that we have already implemented, renewables takes off, right? So let's say we were starting from a baseline scenario, the impact is gonna be much different. So that's another thing to take into account when we're talking about implementing policies is taking into account what is already implemented. So in this scenario where renewables are already taking off, we've already bumped down our fossil fuels quite a bit, not extensively we see this dynamic happening where renewables is mostly responsible for replacing oil. But if you take a notice, something that happens a lot if we reduce fossil fuel use really quickly and the demand stays the same or even continues to actually increase is how are we filling in that demand? So you'll notice if you take a look, especially at that blue line of natural gas, something that happens, um, which is called the rebound effect. So is we get a, a decrease in emissions or temperature, but it's kind of rebounded a little bit because natural gas increases pretty significantly. So does coal uh, just a bit towards the end of the century, because to fill that demand, we're seeing uh, gas and coal come back a little bit, because even though we've reduced the price the speed of things might not be enough for renewable energy. So we make it, uh, we see a bit of this rebound effect where actually gas and coal come up a little bit. And so if we take a look at a baseline scenario,
and then we stop oil infrastructure. Hmm. That's interesting. That seems like a bug. <laughs> so we'll test that one out. I wouldn't expect to see the temperature increase, but we see that the change changes so much because we were already so heavy on coal and natural gas and we haven't yet subsidized renewable energy. And so coal and natural gas shoot up. And I see that uh, Tina was saying that we should also uh, stop infrastructure of other uh, fossil fuels as well in order to really have that increase stay consistent on the renewable energy side, which is a great, uh, a great suggestion when we're looking at policies like this. So talking about how might other sources of energy be impacted by stopping infrastructure? Are we going to see more fracking? Um, are we going to see a bit of that increase in coal to make up for some of the energy demand? And when we stop the infrastructure of oil, we also see the share of uh, electrification of vehicles go up significantly. And so because of that, there is a big spike in demand for electricity. And uh, because renewable energy might not be able to fully meet that demand, we still see that's another reason why we see coal and gas bump up a little bit. So the suggestion of bumping down coal and gas is a great one to make sure that it's from the, uh, that we're seeing that increase in renewable energy. All right, so let's take a look at some others. There is a couple, I've been noting some of your um, ideas and suggestions when it comes to uh, consumption and population growth as well. And so we'll talk about some of the dynamics that are happening there as well. And so the next one is our methane and other greenhouse gases. And so when we look at this graph here, we've done a pretty good job of decreasing our energy CO2 use. And so as we continue to work on energy CO2, through some of the other solutions that you all have suggested that are coming up, we still have these other greenhouse gases for us to tackle. And so let's take a look at what happens when we reduce our other greenhouse gas uses. So that might look like changing our agricultural practices, less meat consumption, Mm, different industrial processes, uh, reducing our waste when it comes to both agriculture and industry. So let's take a look at that. So that makes a pretty big impact. So 0.5 degrees is one of the biggest ones that we've seen so far because you're directly tackling a lot of emissions that are outside of our CO2 emissions. So we take a look at that. So we basically brought that, those wedges down. Methane tends to be one of the more challenging ones to reduce. There's a lot of different policies that are being considered when it comes to methane reduction. And so there are, different ways in which we can do that. And we see that, especially because a lot of those additional greenhouse gases are very potent. So they lead to more warming than the same amount of CO2 might. So we're seeing it have quite a big impact here. So we're at 2.3 degrees Celsius. So we're doing really good on our, on our solution and our scenario. And let's just keep testing a few that you all have suggested. And then I'll address some of the points that I'm seeing on uh, 
education of women and girls, which also kind of gets grouped into a few different ones as well. All right, so the next is electrification of transport. And so again, we might see a different outcome here given what we've already done in this scenario. So if we take a look at where we are with the electric share of transport. So we started here on this black line, but because we eliminated oil, the system adjusted to rely on uh, electricity for its transport system. So we saw a lot of that bump happening anyway. So we'll probably see less of a change here than we might see if we started from a baseline scenario. And so let's take a look at what happens here. So if we continue to electrify and we really bump that number up. So we see that still have a positive impact. We're going to 2.2 degrees from 2.3. That's because it's pushing uh, oil even further back and having renewables grow a bit quicker. Another thing to take into consideration is when, is where our energy, especially our electricity is coming from. So in a renewables dominant world, we would expect the electricity that is powering our transport system to be pulled mostly from renewables. Again, if we come here, where we have a lot of coal and natural gas and we electrify, we start to see a shift and kind of an increase in coal and gas as well. So when we're talking about electrification of vehicles, where is that electricity being pulled from is really important to take into account as well. If you're living in a really cold dominant world and you switch to electricity, you're gonna be pulling your electricity to power your car from coal, which electric vehicles tend to be on average more energy efficient than, than cars with internal combustion engines, but they're still taking their electricity from coal from a fossil fuel. So another important consideration when we're talking about electrifying. All right, the last one on my list right now, and I'll start tackling some of your considerations and questions is energy efficiency. So we've split up energy efficiency into two different categories. So we have increased energy efficiency of our transport system. So this would be anything that is requiring the transport system to use less energy. So on the one hand, that could be improved technologies that are making things run smoother with less energy, or that could just mean using less energy intensive transport sources. So that could be walking more, biking more, and so when we talk about energy efficiency and we can test it both for transport and buildings, we're just talking about overall using less energy. So again, that's going to look different based on the current scenario that we're in. So here we're using a lot of renewable energy. So when we increase the, the energy efficiency, all the energy supplies go down which includes renewable energy. It just makes it, it just makes the overall energy demand go down. So we're seeing that have a positive impact on temperature. So that got us down from 2.2 to 2.1. Again, if we were in a super coal and gas and oil dominated world, and then we reduced our energy use, that might look different. So here, most of what's happening is we're using less renewable energy, which has benefits to just supply and being able to supply enough energy to the world. And so we see our natural gas going down a little bit, our coal going down a little bit as well. So we're seeing that positive impact. 
And then if we couple it with our buildings and industry energy efficiency, same thing, it's just using less energy in our buildings and industry. So that could be implementing energy efficient technologies in buildings and appliances or just using less. So you'll see some similar dynamics here. Buildings in the in and industry are super energy dominant and heavy. And so you see that big bump down to our energy demand. And you see that this wedge here is starting to get smaller and smaller when it comes to energy CO2. Let's do that one more time. And you'll see we've reached our two degree world, but let's try to keep pushing us down to a more just world of 1.5 degrees. All right. So a few questions that I've been seeing. Let's take a look at what's called the Kaya identity. And so this is essentially primarily for our CO2 energy emissions. And so the Kaya identity basically tells us that if we multiply global population, global GDP, the energy intensity of GDP, and how carbon intensive our energy system is, that all multiplied together gives us our carbon emissions from energy. And so when we see energy continuing to increase throughout the end of the century, even though we've done a really good job of decarbonizing, we see that the carbon intensity has really decreased. We've improved on our energy intensity, which means for, for every unit of GDP, less energy is required. And so we've done a good job through energy efficiency to do that. And so what are some other things that we can consider that we haven't yet tackled? So I saw a lot of uh, suggestions in the chat talking about our con consumption, talking about our economic growth, our population growth. And so we see that throughout the end of the century, we expect population and GDP to increase pretty substantially. And so that's going to have an increased need for uh, energy. And so these tend to have a lot of equity considerations when we talk about impacting population and economic growth. So that's why these are a bit trickier to implement when it comes to policies and actions because there are so many equity considerations here. But if we look at just changing the rate of growth a little bit, which could come from uh, a lot of education of women and girls, could come from what economic growth looks like in society, uh, what impact that might have so that we don't see that necessarily huge upward trend. Um, so let's say we lowered the growth a little. And this, when we're talking about switching economic and population growth, we're not talking about decreasing it. We're talking about just changing the growth rate. So we don't have it as an option here to limit population. We just have the option to limit the rate of growth. So when we're talking about population, we're talking about instead of 10.9 billion people in 2100, we're talking about 9.1 billion people. So that's on, this is based on the UN's population ranges. Um, and so this would be on the low growth rate side. And then for economic growth, we're talking about instead of a growth rate of 1.5% per year, we have a growth rate of 0.5% per year. And so we see the temperature go down a bit, but maybe not as much as we might expect. There's a lot of uh, ad advocacy for um, who, for complete degrowth scenarios, which we aren't able to, model in this in this 
simulation, but uh, there have been there has been a lot of advocacy for what degrowth could look like. And so when we're talking about population, I see a couple of factors here in the chat. Definitely lim limiting population brings some problems. Definitely. There's a lot of considerations to come uh, that come with limiting population. Um, and so that's why it's not necessarily a policy that we advocate super strongly for or that we model a super limited population growth. Um, we just kind of keep it within the bounds of what is projected and lower it just a bit. And like Janet is saying, there's the birth rates are changing country by country through different means of education and support. This will look different as well. So there's a lot of considerations to take into account. And so we're at a 1.9 degree world. Let me bring us back. So there are a few other ones for us to take a look at here, given what you all have voted on. Let me take a look. All right. So we have a few different options here when it comes to additional solutions. <clears throat> so um, I saw that there was quite a few questions on new zero carbon and what exactly that means. And so when we talk about new zero carbon, that is a new source of energy that doesn't emit carbon. And so what happens when we invest heavily in that, again, will highly depend on what solutions we've already implemented. And so when we implement a breakthrough in this scenario, we're not gonna see as much of an impact. So I'll take a look at it in a baseline scenario. So, one of the biggest dynamics that we see when we implement several different renewable sources of energy or low carbon sources of energy is that a lot of times they can actually compete with each other a bit in the market. So you'll notice that this orange line that spikes up here is actually leading to a decrease in our renewable energy. And so it's not having a big impact on temperature because it's taking up some of that demand from our renewable energy sources. And so when we look at it in a baseline scenario, that might look a bit different. So we see again, though, that it's competing a bit with renewable energy. So it's not displacing our fossil fuels as much as we'd like, but it's still displacing our coal and our gas pretty significantly. And so we see a slight temperature change. And so some of the different technologies that have been looked into and researched are things like nuclear fusion and thorium fission, which are different ways to produce energy in a low carbon or zero carbon way. And so that's a quick overview of what a new zero carbon technology might look like and what dynamics it might have in a world like this. And so the other one that I saw was technological carbon removal. So when we're talking about technological carbon removal, it, we're talking about a lot of different types of technologies. So the ones that we model, uh, I won't go too much into detail about what each one specifically means, but they're just different types of technologies or frameworks around removing carbon. So if you're familiar with some of these technologies, I'll just name them out for you. So one, we have BEX, which is bioenergy, carbon capture and storage. Another one that we include is direct air capture. A third is enhanced mineralization, agricultural soil carbon sequestration, and biochar. So these are different methods to remove carbon from the atmosphere. A lot of them include, uh, involve storing carbon underground in one way or another. And so 
there are a lot of considerations when we talk about uh, technological carbon removal. So I might ask us to answer this question again here uh, for those of you who might have some thoughts about what are some considerations for us to take into account when it comes to technological carbon removal? So that is implementing technologies that are going to remove carbon from the atmosphere. So what are some things for us to take into account when we are implementing these policies or implementing these technologies around the world? A lot of energy is required, definitely. I see um, Tina in the chat making a great point to this question when it comes to new zero carbon is uh, some of the considerations to take into some of the unknown technology uh, that exists. The inclusion of carbon capture technologies are expensive and not wise or helpful. Thanks Tina in the chat. Some of the more natural uh, technologies like biochar and soil sequestration, um, taking a look at how those might be more impactful than others. Income inequality, the impacts on those living near the places where they will be implemented definitely could lead to greater inequality, equity in the distribution of those benefits. Using a lot of energy to operate, yep big producers so who's bearing the cost when it comes to implementing these technologies and should it be those big producers um mm -hmm. pipeline build out for co2 transport there's sometimes an adverse impact on poor communities in the chat unintended consequences definitely that's a huge one when it comes to technological carbon removal is the knowledge that we have around it can be uh, pretty limited. There's a lot of research going on now uh, as we try to learn more and more, but there are still a lot of questions. So that's definitely something to take into account as to what those unintended consequences could look like. So thanks everybody. And so uh, kind of a way that we like to talk about uh, carbon removal, the same way we also like to talk about um, net zero, uh, net zero pledges, net zero uh, policies, is we like to imagine a bathtub. And we have the faucet and we have the drain. And so in the bathtub, the water in the bathtub is our amount of greenhouse gas emissions or our carbon um whichever way you're looking at net zero and so we want to get the least amount of water in the bathtub so we can either make the drain bigger or turn the faucet off or both and so usually when we're thinking about that you tend to want to turn the faucet off to limit the water uh, because the drain will keep going because we have natural ways to sequester carbon as well. So we're always gonna have a slight drain, but just the size of the drain will, will depend on what other means of technological carbon removal we're looking at. But we tend to see turning the faucet off as a more effective strategy. So that's why we tend to advocate for reducing emissions on the supply side, on the emission side, as opposed to emitting them and then pulling them out. But we'll take a look at what that looks like because with a lot of net zero pledges and with the progress, the slow progress that we're tending to make, a lot of policies tend to take into account carbon removal technology. So it's something that we should be aware of and consider in the event that we'll need to take on more of these. So if we take a look and we're implementing these technologies at a medium growth, we are seeing a drop in 0.3 degrees. So we start to see that light gray wedge come down. 
And so that's having a negative balance to some of those positive emissions still. And so a oh, another means of carbon removal, someone was advocating for more natural uh, carbon removal technologies or solutions is afforestation. So that's planting trees. Uh, that'll also get us into the negative based on how many trees we plant. So I'll add on that a little bit. And for both of these, one of the big considerations I saw in the polls that a lot of people were saying um, that it takes a lot of energy, which is very true. The other thing it takes a lot of is land. And so when we take a look at land, so uh, especially those ones that are uh, back, so bio, bioenergy, carbon capture and storage, biochar, and afforestation primarily are the ones that take up a lot of uh, biomass and land is one, how much land it's gonna take. So just for context, this dotted line is the area of India. And so to get us to a significant amount of reductions, where, what land are we going to be using? Those are some big equity considerations. Whose land, um, there were some, answers in the poll around kind of this not in my backyard uh, perspective when it comes to technologies like this and so people not wanting to give up their land for these projects. And so that's another consideration when we're talking about uh, technological carbon removal is uh, the amount of land needed. And especially when we talk about afforestation, but others as well is the amount of time it takes to have a significant impact on carbon removal. So again, one of the big insights that we've seen in a lot of the different policies that we've created and implemented in this scenario is the delay in the system. And so that's the same for technology, carbon removal of any kind. You see that it takes quite a bit of time to be implemented both on a technological scale and also on just a natural scale of when we're planting trees, they take a long time to get to the point of being able to sequester enough carbon. So you'll see this green area here takes a long time to build up and up. And so a lot of these were again, seeing their impacts 20 to 50 years down the line. And so again, just even more advocacy for the urgency of implementing a lot of policies as soon as possible so that we can get to the futures that we've been thinking about and uh, aiming towards. And so let's see where we are now. I think we are very close to our 1.5 degree world. A couple things when we are in this a uh, solution-based scenario with a lot of different ones is what impact those last few solutions might have. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I see Reda's asking for the impact of electrifying buildings. So rooftop solar, yep. And so let's take a look at that. So here we have our positive impact and we're down to 1.4 degrees. So thanks Retta for that last suggestion. So here again is where you'll see the need for more electricity because we're basing our buildings um, and our industry in uh, electricity as opposed to anything that's oil powered. Um, so we're gonna see that bump back up again in energy demand, but because our energy is mostly uh, low carbon, we're not, we're gonna still see it having a positive impact. And so we see that renewable energy and that new zero carbon bump back up a little bit because more of that energy is needed and that electricity is needed to continue powering our buildings. And so congratulations, everyone. We have a 1.4 degree world. You all did so great. 
I am going to actually share the scenario with you all in the chat. It's a pretty long URL, um, but you'll actually be able to open this exact scenario in your browser. Keep playing around. I see Elizabeth, Elizabeth is asking about decreasing natural gas. So you can keep testing that if you want, Elizabeth. And because in this scenario, we've already decreased natural gas quite a bit through other means, the, the impact of implementing an additional policy might be less than if we were to start from a baseline scenario and decrease natural gas. So you can test out those different scenarios in which decreasing natural gas might have different impacts across different uh, scenarios. And so we've created this 1.4 degree world. Look at all of the solutions that we've implemented and talked about. So I just wanna ask you all to take a moment, both just to kind of sit with yourself in imagining that type of world. And when you get a chance, um, maybe share in this poll, what would you love about being a part of a world on track to making this scenario happen? So what would you love about being a part of a world that gets us to 1.4 degrees? So I'll just give you all a couple minutes to sit in silence, sit with yourselves and share in the poll what you'd love about being a part of this future. And uh, I will read those aloud so that we can all share together. Wow, I'm really loving the answers coming in. Thank you, everyone. I'll start reading them out, but feel free to keep reflecting and I'll, there'll be another prompt to continue reflecting a bit. So what would you love about being a part of a world on track to making the scenario happen? Some really great answers. Knowing that the beloved children of God will be able to continue living in God's good creation. The increased sense of being a part of community that is focused on caring for one another. Our children's children's children will inherit a better earth. Renewal of my faith in humans. Yeah. Sustainable future for the next generation. The implication would be that we would have resolved many other social justice issues in order to make this happen. Yes. So important. That's a really great one. Meeting our obligations to all future generations. Being a part of making such a difference would be so fulfilling. Yeah a better earth for my descendants. Gratitude for leaving the world in a slightly better shape for all creation's future generations, being a part of the solution. And I know that there are a couple great ones in the chat as well. A livable planet for future generations, 
greater peace among peoples, cooperation to achieve a larger purpose, ending the toxic, unequal, and life-destroying impacts of fossil fuel extractions, ending support and subsidies for fossil fuel corporations that are backing, backing authoritarian regimes and oligarchies of power that are damaging de democracies around the world, joy for one another in all creations, making the world better for all of God's creation, that our actions and sacrifices will show our love for God's creation will help to preserve life on earth. Being able to answer yes to God if he asks, did you help take care of my creation? Wow, thanks everybody. This is really, really powerful. So there's one more question that I'd like to ask that is what else is coming up for you? Any feelings, experiences, or thoughts? Uh, we tend to uh, not take enough time to reflect on kind of the emotional side of a lot of these uh, issues. And so um, asking again, if there's anything that's coming up for you, it's always powerful to share with each other how we're feeling. We tend to see quite a range of emotions. So I'll just give you another minute or so to just sit with yourselves and uh, share anything that's coming up for you. Uh, and how you're feeling. Thanks everyone for the great responses. I'll read out the ones in this poll first and then I'll come to the chat. Feeling hopeful, struggling with how to engage others on such a complex issue, definitely. That is uh, why sometimes a presentation like this can be a nice kind of starting point for people because it's so complex. And I saw somebody else, um, in the poll saying that they'd love some of their climate activist friends to experience this presentation. And um, I will also leave my email address in the chat. So anyone can feel free to reach out and I would be happy. We run these um, to as many people as we can. So please feel free to reach out and I would uh, love to connect with anybody else who might be interested in uh, learning about this model and other of these issues. We also really encourage you all to run workshops like this as well. Um, that's why we make these models free and available to everybody. So uh, if you're interested in that, also feel free to uh, reach out and I'd be happy to share. The simulation shows that it'll be an incredible challenge to limit global temperature to a life sustainable level. Definitely. I think that's kind of the mixed emotion of a, of a simulation like this is on the one hand, it shows what a challenge it will be, but on the other hand, you are able to see what is needed and you have kind of a clear 
idea of that, which might limit some of that complexity and that just uh, confusion that can exist and seeing it in a bit more of a clear way can sometimes help with some of that challenge. Advent is a great opportunity to prepare a new initiative toward addressing climate disruption in our churches, communities, and world. Thank you. Yeah, anxious. Um, definitely. I, I think that that's also a, a great part of coming together to talk about it is knowing that you're not alone in those feelings and that uh, sometimes sharing feelings with others can, can be a source of hope when you see other people feeling a bit hopeful or feeling the same way that you're feeling. I'm worried that inertia and hopelessness will prevent us from beginning the very hard actions we need to take to save Earth. Yeah. Yeah. What can I do? What can my faith community do? So how can we come together? Mm -hmm. Building the nonviolent mass movements to, to move this environmental climate and creative creation justice vision forward. Overcome greed, selfishness, and apathy. Yes. Challenge your state reps. Continue to promote plant-based eating among our congregation. Mm, mentor our young people in this information and lifestyle to follow. Yes. My experience has been that people do not like change even for the better. Yes, so true. <laughs> Seeing so many ways that we can make a difference. Yeah. <laughs> One step at a time, but there are so many steps. Very true. We often like to say uh, that whatever step you take is helpful because there are so many, you're a part of the solution by just taking a step at all. Thanks everyone. Um, we got a lot of, of these answers from some of these other questions, but I'll just pose it as another way to kind of share and build on each other's ideas and knowledge are what are some ideas for what you might do next? I saw some great ideas in the chat and in some of these answers, but if you have any other ones that you'd like to share, just so that uh, together you can build some of that knowledge and, and build on uh, each other's ideas, I uh, would love to hear any ideas for how you might take some of those next steps. Uh, what might that look like for you? What part of change would you like to be a part of? I'll give you all just a minute and then I'll start reading them out. Yeah, such great answers again. So I'll start from our poll here. Yeah, so this Bill McKibben quote is actually something that we like to say a lot in how we tend to present our, and our the model is a great way to address this, I, this notion of a silver bullet. Another way that we've started framing it um, is it takes many seeds to plant a garden. And so that's how we like to think about this kind of many solutions approach and there's no one solution that's going to solve it. So I saw a lot of people saying they'd like to hold these types of workshops in their local churches. 
at a climate justice fair, identify allies and encourage one another in the work. Yeah, share this information with others. Mm -hmm. Join with others to affect the solutions. Promote nonviolent direct actions, yep. Build up positive ideas and projects and don't bash on people with negatives. Yeah, that's a great perspective on how you talk to people and, and building up some of their ideas. And, and uh, those are ways to, to kind of maybe challenge mental models in a way that doesn't need to be you know, negative. Um, so that's a great one, Christy. Mm -hmm. So the, the fair in April, changing lifestyles, electing local and national leaders who feel like we do about climate change solutions, definitely. Mm, using solar energy for churches, yeah, and living complexes. Mm -hmm. Extin Extinction Rebellion, yep. Building deliberative democracy. Yeah, thanks so much, everyone. Talk to everyone you know about eliminating fossil fuel subsidies. Yep. Encouraging people to reconnect with our oneness with all of creation. Mm, putting on Earth Day celebrations, including a service to get the message out and start projects. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you all so much for these answers. I really appreciate your kind of willingness to connect with each other and share. So I am really happy for that. Um, and I think as we kind of wrap up, I'll stop sharing and just leave some time for any questions and any wrap ups. So Katie, if there's anything that uh, you've been looking at and Amy, or I can go through the Q and A, uh, whatever you prefer. Yeah, um, Yasmin, thank you so much for the presentation, the workshop. You put it so well. I was just reflecting that this was just a really great way to kind of talk about what we've been discussing um, this week during the webinar series. So thank you so much for that. And you've been doing such a great job of answering a lot of the questions mm -hmm. that's been coming in. So there really isn't that many uh, questions um, that you didn't touch on. Um, I think one that would be kind of nice um, and, and then we'll enter the closing afterwards, but um, somebody asked, um, are these workshops being um, conducted with like congressional members or um, other national leaders? Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. And I'll kind of answer it broadly too for those of you who are asking about, you know, your friends and other members that you'd like to have see this presentation. Yeah, so we've actually been pretty successful in offering this presentation to basically any kind of, any groups and any people. So we, we because it's so able to tailor it, we've had success presenting it to, I think we've reached over a hundred members of Congress in the United States um, through, both ourselves presenting and we also train people to present this model and this workshop themselves. And so those people who have been trained will then go to their local member of Congress and present. So those are always options. So that's why we work really hard to make the model freely available to anybody so that you can take the model, learn how to present it, and then go if you have connections to an elected official, or if you oftentimes it's, you're able to kind of meet with their staffers um, so we've been pretty successful in that. And we also have been able to train people around the world. I think we have about a thousand people around the world who have, who have facilitated these events so far. And I think over maybe 95 countries. And so oftentimes they have connections to their elected officials. And so they're able to reach them. And the great thing I think about the model and the workshop is that you can both present it to elected officials or five-year-old kids, which we've also had people present to, or, you know, schools, it's really popular with a lot of teachers and academics, and they teach it to their classrooms, also for private companies, depending on, you know, where you or a friend might work, so I think the great thing about the model and the workshop is that 
one, it's freely available for anyone to present to anyone they want, and it, you can kind of tailor it to whoever. So we've been pretty successful in getting it to uh, a lot of elected officials, mostly in the United States, but also around the world. So uh, it's been great so far. Thank you so much. And it's really great to hear that it's been shared so readily with um, members of Congress. Mm -hmm. um, I'll definitely be sharing uh, your email um, sure. and um, the website to the En-ROADS uh, website on, in the follow-up email. So thank you so much. Um, I'll send it over to Katie now. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Amy. Oh, yes. Uh, Yasmin, thank you so much for like your energy mm -hmm. and the awesome facilitation skills that you offered our community today. Um, and it's great to learn of the impact and how many people want to continue engaging in this conversation and take concrete action. So we give thanks for your commitment to building a more just and sustainable future for all of humanity and creation. So thank you for that witness and the ways that you pushed us to consider um, our personal impact and the larger impacts that our systems have today. Um, when we move into closing announcements. And I want to be sure that um, everyone who's been a part of these webinars knows that we can reach out to our senators by simply um, calling them or signing on to the sign-on letter that has been created for this series that just uh, promotes climate justice as a priority in the Build Back Better plan and also in the annual uh, funding and financing bills that are currently um, being legislated. And then together, we can act by signing on to these letters, by making calls, and these actions will help us address the climate crisis um, so that we can get to those more uh, just and equitable future for all. So. If you haven't had time to register yet, uh, you can still register for our final panel of this series uh, focused on a just transition. So that will be um, coming to you live at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And any of our other workshops are available as a resource to you on our UMC Justice YouTube page. We're so grateful for your participation today and for this interactive workshop that helped us put into practice um, and uh, what we've been learning and thinking about. So thank you all. Thank you all so much. I truly appreciate all of your participation. So. <laughs>